What if the largest elephants in history weren't just impressive in size, but were also nature's original engineers? The straight-tusked Paleoloxodon didn't merely eat plants, its movements restructured forests, spread seeds, and even created watering holes. In this video, we'll trace their massive footprints, uncover how their feeding reshaped entire habitats, and see what happened when early humans crossed paths with them. Estimates of their size vary. The best documented adult specimen reached about 4.3 meters at the shoulder and weighed around 13 tons. A much older fragmentary femur suggested a possible size near 5.2 meters and 19 to 22 tons, but researchers treat that larger figure as highly speculative, whatever the exact number these were among the heaviest land mammals to ever walk the earth. When paleontologists study Paleoloxodon, they often point out that its anatomy tells us more than its raw size ever could. The key lies in three distinct features, its straightforward projecting tusks, the unusual parieto occipital crest that rose like a bony headband across the skull, and the mechanical consequences of these structures for movement, feeding, and balance. Together, they give us a picture of an animal that was built differently from any living elephant, the tusks alone were astonishing. Unlike the curved weapons of modern elephants, these pointed ahead in long beams of ivory. Complete specimens are rare, but one preserved fragment has been estimated to reach about 3.66 meters, if intact, to roughly the length of a small car. In the largest animals, a single tusk could weigh more than 190 kilograms. Forward pointing ivory of that length and weight placed a continuous balancing challenge on the skull and spine. That's where the next detail becomes essential. The parieto occipital crest was not decorative. This rim of bone spread backward from the top of the skull, dramatically increasing the area where strong neck muscles could attach. In Paleoloxodon, especially in mature males, the crest expanded into a thick domed form that reinforced the back of the head. It provided leverage against the enormous load of the tusks. By comparison, Asian elephants today show a moderately enlarged neutral region but nothing approaching this specialized structure while African elephants lack it outright. The difference makes clear that Paleoloxodon had evolved a very specific adaptation, a skeletal anchor, to counterbalance its unusual equipment. That third point, the consequence puts the details into perspective. With tusks projecting forward, the animal's center of gravity shifted, and every movement of the head would generate torque against the neck and spine. The enlarged crest anchored muscles that let the skull pivot with efficiency rather than constant strain. You can imagine the profile, an elephantine skull reinforced with a wide headband like ridge holding tusks as long as a family car straight in front. The strength built into that design meant the tusks were not just ornaments. They were working tools heavy enough to split tree bark, push down saplings or excavate soil while the crest and neck supported those actions without exhausting the animal. Streamlining the anatomy down to these three points, tusks, crest and balance shows how Paleoloxodon skeleton carried a kind of built in engineering. Modern elephants share broad similarities in body form, but none combine such massive tusks with such an exaggerated cranial structure. These extinct animals represent a different solution to the problem of being enormous, don't just grow larger, redesign the head and neck to handle new mechanical stresses. The crest is even more telling when we consider how it varied. Fossils show that males typically had deeper, thicker versions than females, and the structure grew more robust with maturity. That pattern makes sense for an adaptation linked to heavy tusks and perhaps to social displays. But its primary function remained practical, keeping the skull stable under constant forward set weight. Understanding this redesign changes how we see them. They weren't simply scaled up elephants that happened to have straighter tusks. Their very anatomy was a solution to challenges created by tusks so large, they reshaped the skeleton itself. And when creatures evolved with that kind of reinforcement, they could act on their surroundings in ways no modern elephant quite matches. Instead of feeling like curiosities locked in bone, these features become a blueprint for power tools, for altering the environment, as much as for defending or feeding. And once you consider what those tools allowed them to do in practice, the story moves beyond anatomy. Because when herds this size walk together, their presence wasn't limited to their bones or bodies. It was written directly into the landscapes under their feet. 
When Pelea Luxord and Herds crossed the landscape, they did more than move from point A to point B. They physically reorganized the ground beneath them. Their sheer weight pressed soil into hard surfaces, turning soft terrain into leveled tracks. Unlike the narrow trails you might picture from deer or cattle, these were broad corridors, sometimes road-like in scale, made by repeated trampling over generations. The compression of soil slowed recovery, meaning those corridors could persist for long time scales as open passages through grasslands and wooded areas. Modern elephants give us an instructive comparison. In African savannas, herds break branches, topple small trees and trample vegetation until lasting trails emerge. Multiply that behavior by an animal several tons heavier, carrying forward projecting tusks capable of pushing through brush. And you can see how Paleoloxodon could create and maintain larger pathways. Paleoecological work suggests that such corridors accumulated impact as herds returned seasonally slowly, carving persistent lines through otherwise dense terrain. The fossil record grounds this picture in evidence. One of the most striking examples comes from the Matalascanias trampled surface in Huelva, Spain, dating to about 125,000 years ago. Here, dozens of Paleoloxodon antiquus trackways are preserved in remarkable detail, complete with toe impressions. The distribution of footprints indicates family groups, calves no more than two years old, walking alongside larger juveniles and adult females. Some of the smaller tracks converge directly into the larger ones, suggesting calves kept close contact while moving. Such patterns are not random. Much like living elephants, these herds appear to have been organized around social care, with matriarchs guiding groups through a marshy landscape. Similar evidence comes from the Marathausa site in Greece, where straight tusked elephant remains and associated track surfaces point to groups traveling and interacting at the margins of bodies of water. Across both regions, the evidence consistently shows not isolated individuals, but structured herds moving in coordinated ways across the environment. This aligns with what we know from modern elephants trails are not made by a wanderer, but by entire groups returning pressing paths deeper with each crossing. Over centuries of repetition, such group behavior gave rise to stable corridors connecting water food, patches and seasonal ranges. These physical imprints rippled outward into the wider web of life. A cleared corridor was not just for elephants, it offered narrower species a ready passage as well. Herbivores like deer or wild cattle could reach resources more directly, and even Neanderthals were likely to follow these openings in the landscape. At Matalascanias, Neanderthal footprints preserved alongside those of elephants suggest that people recognized and used the same resource zones. For hominins moving through dense coastal vegetation, an elephant-made trail was effectively ready-made infrastructure. Predators too likely adjusted to these predictable pathways as herds of large mammals provided reliable access to prey. This role as pathmakers framed ecosystems not only in geography but in opportunity. The trails they maintained didn't just alter where animals could move, they set up the conditions for plants to spread as well. What they trampled beneath their feet was only half the story because what went into their mouths became the other engine of change and that is where their meals began shaping the forests of tomorrow. In shaping landscapes, Paleoloxodon also carried out another role, one that botanists today would recognize immediately. They became accidental gardeners of the Pleistocene, spreading and reshaping plant life, not through planning, but through the ordinary act of feeding. Their vast appetites brought them into contact with almost every kind of vegetation across Eurasia, from dense woodlands to wide grasslands. Each day, these elephants consume bark leaves, grasses, and fallen fruit in immense quantities. Isotope and toothware studies show Paleoloxodon had mixed diets, some species grazing more heavily, like Pina medicus, while others shifted toward browsing or mixed feeding, depending on the region. This broad dietary range meant they ingested seeds from different habitats and transported them far beyond the reach of the parent plants. Seeds swallowed whole could pass through the digestive tract undamaged, then return to the soil embedded in a rich layer of dung. Modern elephants are known to disperse seeds across kilometers, but the even larger size and range of Paleoloxodon suggests that their role as long distance plant carriers was magnified on a continental scale. You can picture the effect. A herd paused at a floodplain feeding until nightfall. Days later, when they rested on higher, drier ground, their dung scattered with seeds fertilized entirely new patches of vegetation. Shrubs and saplings that sprouted from those droppings created mixed edges between open grass and shaded groves. What began as digestion became habitat renewal. 
Scientists argue that without such large animals acting as mobile dispersers, many tree and shrub lineages would have remained restricted, their seeds never moving far from the parent canopy. Dispersal was not their only contribution. With their forward pointing tusks, adults were capable of prying at trunks and even uprooting trees. This produced immediate structural consequences in forests. When one or more trees fell, the canopy opened, sunlight reached the ground, and suppressed plants suddenly had access to light. Grasses rooted in these gaps and shrubs claimed footholds where only leaf litter had existed. Fallen timber itself became useful, offering food and shelter to insects, fungi, and small vertebrates. By repeating this process across centuries, Paleoloxodon helped prevent uniform single species woodlands from dominating. The result was a patchwork of microhabitats supporting a broader variety of species than any stable but monotonous forest could sustain. Evidence for this kind of impact finds support in isotopic records which show flexibility across shifting climates of the Pleistocene. These giant herbivores could adapt whether glacial cycles favoured grassy plains or interglacials allowed thicker forests to expand and their feeding influenced both habitats in turn. A creature weighing over 10 tons did not simply take from its surroundings. It continuously remodeled them, ensuring habitats were in flux and species composition remained diverse. The reach of their ecological work becomes clearer when viewed in hindsight. Scientists studying modern ecosystems note that the decline of elephants today sharply reduces the movement of large seeds. Trees, depending on these dispersers, see their offspring concentrated beneath parent canopies with a limited chance to expand. Applied to Paleoloxodon, the principle suggests that their disappearance would have left lasting gaps in regeneration patterns. The extinction of one of the largest seed carriers in Earth's history did not just reduce animal diversity, it cut one of the main threads connecting forests across regions. The story of Paleoloxodon takes a sharper turn once we look at its encounters with hominins. These giants had roamed across Eurasia for hundreds of thousands of years without challenge from natural predators. But archaeological evidence shows that stone tool using hominins began to interact with their remains in ways that left unmistakable marks in the fossil record. The case of Pampor in the Kashmir Valley is one of the clearest examples, giving us a rare window into how human relatives engage with such massive animals. At Pampore dating to roughly 300,000 to 400,000 years ago, archaeologists uncovered remains of a straight tusked elephant alongside 87 basalt stone tools. The association is not accidental cut marks etched across the bones, show that hominins deliberately process the carcass, slicing into muscle tissue and preparing large sections for consumption. Even more telling are the percussion fractures on limb bones, where blows cracked open the dense shafts to reach the fat-rich marrow inside. Nutritionally, marrow is among the most valued resources a forager can obtain, and its recovery here suggests not random scavenging, but a practiced routine of butchery. What makes Pampori so critical is its age. This represents the earliest known evidence of elephant exploitation in the Indian subcontinent. Until this discovery, many assumed that elephants were beyond the reach of hominins so far back in time, with only occasional scavenging of carcasses possible. Yet the deliberate processing at Pampor indicates something more systematic. Still interpretation requires care. Archaeologists caution that we cannot tell whether the hominins actively hunted the elephant or whether they exploited an already weakened or dead individual. The research leaves open the question of hunting versus opportunism, underscoring that while confrontation with giants was possible, routine elephant hunting cannot yet be claimed. The discoveries also reveal something about planning and mobility. The basalt used for tools at Pampor was not local. It had to be brought in from elsewhere, signaling forethought, raw material transport, and some level of coordination. Processing a multi-ton animal would not have been a solitary act, but one involving social cooperation with multiple hominins working in sequence to cut crack and distribute resources. In this sense, Pampore shows not only that elephants entered their diets, but that the encounter reflected broader shifts in how hominin groups organized their survival strategies. Further clues to the presence of Paleoloxodon in this region come from another remarkable discovery, a skull in Kashmir attributed to Paleoloxodon Turkmenicus. Morphological details, particularly the underdeveloped Parieto occipital crest, place it between earlier African forms and the massive Eurasian species. This makes the specimen a key evolutionary link, filling gaps in our knowledge of elephant dispersal and adaptation. 
Unlike Pampor, however, this fossil was not directly tied to archaeological butchery evidence. Its value lies in showing that multiple Paleoloxidan lineages were present in South Asia, shaping the possibilities for hominin interaction, depending on which form was locally available. Taken together, Pampore and the Kashmiri fossils complicate how we think about hominin diets in the Middle Pleistocene. Small animals like antelope and deer certainly remained staple food sources, but evidence now shows that straight-tusked elephants were not entirely beyond exploitation. Marrow extraction skinning and large-scale processing broadened the resource base, even if such opportunities were infrequent. The archaeological record makes one point clear hominins exploited elephants for sustenance when circumstances allowed, yet whether they often brought them down alive or mostly took advantage of weakened or dead individuals remains unresolved. The ecological consequences of these encounters were wide ranging. Each Paleoloxodon removed from its environment was more than the loss of a single animal. It was the loss of a keystone force. Without those herds moving seeds across kilometers, breaking open canopies and opening pathways, ecosystems slowly lost some of their structural diversity. Forests thickened into denser stands, grasses reclaimed fewer openings, and plant distributions became more limited. The absence of these engineers rippled up into herbivore and predator populations, altering accessibility to resources in subtle but accumulating ways. Extinction in the end had consequences larger than disappearance alone. When Paleoloxodon vanished from landscapes, they had helped shape ecosystems did not simply continue unchanged. They became less complex with fewer connections between plant and animal communities. The fall of these giants marked the loss of one of nature's greatest sources of ecological architecture and influence that had stretched across continents and hundreds of thousands of years. It leaves us with a sharper appreciation for their role and a deeper question about what the future holds without such engineers still alive to do their work. Paleoloxodon was an extinct genus of giant elephants, notable not just for its size, but for its role as an ecosystem architect. With their straight tusks and enormous bodies, they changed the landscape by creating pathways, dispersing seeds and regenerating forests. Their extinction, whether due to climate change or human hunting, had major consequences. It wasn't just the loss of a species, but the collapse of a key ecological force, making ecosystems less diverse and complex.